Number 20. Women in the Wild West Stuck to Cooking and Laundry In the era of the Wild West legends, it was often believed that women were limited to submissive and domestic roles, focusing on tasks like baking apple pies and taking care of their husband's clothes. However, this notion is far from accurate. Numerous examples abound of women who defied these stereotypes. One such inspiring figure is Annie Oakley, a remarkably skilled marksman who earned a living by showcasing her talent while touring with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Another woman who shattered expectations was Pearl Hart, who was anything but timid. Starting with minor criminal activities in Arizona, she later joined forces with a man named Joe Boot to plan a stagecoach robbery in 1899. Unfortunately, the two were eventually captured, but Hart managed to engineer an escape. Although she was recaptured, she received a five-year jail sentence. Surprisingly, during her time behind bars, Hart became pregnant, a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Number 19. The whiskey was terrible. Entering the swinging doors of a saloon, take a seat on a bar stool, confidently order the finest whiskey from the bartender, only to be met with a choking sensation. This liquid tastes more like gasoline than the smooth beverage it claims to be. How can this be when the label boasts a 10-year aging process in Kentucky? During those times, copyright laws were lenient, if existent at all. And given the frontier setting, there were few individuals concerned with such matters. In fact, a significant portion of the whiskey being sold may have been adulterated with water or cheaper spirits in order to maximize profits. Whiskey in that era had various colorful nicknames, including Coffin Varnish, Mountain Howitzer, and Tango Leg, a potent liquor that could leave your legs tangled and unsteady as you attempt to make your way out of the bar. Number 18. Want to dine like the Old West? You probably don't. Unsurprisingly, the food in the Wild West era left much to be desired. However, breakfast seemed to be a rare exception, featuring appealing dishes like cornbread, stew, boiled eggs, fried potatoes, and omelets. For dinner, less appetizing options like cow's head, boiled mutton, or soused calf's feet were common. As for dessert, pudding was a typical treat for families on the frontier back in 1853. Cooking methods were straightforward, relying on ovens, frying pans, and roasting spits. The availability of ingredients were limited to whatever meat or vegetables could be sourced during each season. Cowboys, for example, often consumed canned beans, rock-hard biscuits, dried meat, dried fruit, and coffee during their journeys. If you're seeking a taste of history along with modern cultural delights, consider visiting the Buckhorn Saloon and Museum in San Antonio, Texas. Number 17. Forget dysentery, but don't drink the water. Contrary to popular belief among fans of the 1980s computer game, Oregon Trail, pioneers in the Old West did not primarily die from dysentery or rattlesnake bites. The leading cause of death in that era was cholera, a disease caused by waterborne bacteria found in stagnant bodies of water like ponds, puddles, and slow-moving creeks. Unlike modern hikers who have access to advanced water filtering technology, pioneers had to drink water from the nearest available source. Unfortunately, this often meant ingesting the cholera bacteria along with the water, leading to severe symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. With a time frame of 12 hours to a few days, Individuals would succumb to the disease, often due to dehydration. During that time, the only available treatment was an opium-based painkiller, which merely alleviated pain but did not address the underlying illness. Number 16. Dead outlaws were propped up and photographed. Newspapers across the country documented the activities of gangs and infamous outlaws, often adding exaggerated details in contemporary books. When these criminals met their end, the townspeople sought evidence, while the authorities aimed to deter potential lawbreakers by showcasing the fate that awaited them. During the early 1800s, with the advent of photography, a means was found to achieve both objectives. 
the bodies of dead outlaws were exhibited, sometimes with entire gangs arranged closely together, and other times with pairs propped up and positioned for a final photo before being buried six feet underground. Number 15. Elmer McCurdy's corpse had more fun than he did. Elmer McCurdy, 31, was killed by the police after a train robbery in Oklahoma in 1911. This was the final attempt in a series of unsuccessful robberies he had carried out in his short life. McCurdy and his companions mistakenly targeted a passenger train, expecting a significant amount of money, but ended up with only $46, as they had misidentified it as a caddy train carrying a larger sum. Following McCurdy's death, the sheriff allegedly sold his body to a carnival owner who mummified it. The carnival owner used McCurdy's preserved body as an attraction in a traveling sideshow, initially presenting him as the outlaw who would never be captured alive, and later as an example of a drug addict. Unfortunately, McCurdy's body eventually ended up in a warehouse where it remained until 1968. Over time, people forgot its true identity and mistakenly regarded it as a prop. Along with other wax figures, it was sold to the Hollywood Wax Museum and later acquired by an amusement park in California, where it became part of a funhouse exhibit. In 1976, during the filming of The Six Million Dollar Man at the amusement park, McCurdy's body was rediscovered. Accidentally moved by a crew member, McCurdy's arm detached, revealing its wax and paint covering. Finally recognized, McGurdy's remains were returned to Guthrie, Oklahoma in 1977 and laid to rest 66 years after his death. Number 14. The famous OK Corral shootout wasn't much of a shootout. In the infamous OK Corral shootout in Tombstone, Arizona, three people lost their lives and three others were injured. However, despite its notoriety, the gunfight itself lasted a mere 30 seconds. On the side of the law, there were the three Earp brothers, Wyatt, Morgan, and Virgil, and Doc Holliday. On the opposing side were Ike and Billy Clanton, Tom and Frank McClurry, and Billy Claiborne, members and associates of the cowboy gang. Only three of them were armed. It remains uncertain who fired the first shot, but the entire skirmish consisted of just 30 seconds of gunfire and 30 bullets. Virgil shot Clanton in the chest, Doc Holliday used a shotgun to take down Tom, and Wyatt delivered a fatal gut shot to Frank. Clanton and Claiborne escaped, unharmed and without weapons. The Earps and Holliday faced murder charges and a trial followed, with testimonies from individuals sympathetic to the Cowboys who blamed the two, as well as those supporting the Earps who blamed the Cowboys. Ultimately, a judge ruled in favor of the Earps and Holliday, leading to their acquittal. Number 13. Gun control was stricter back then. Contrary to popular imagination, not everyone in the Old West carried guns freely in mainly new established towns on the frontier. Places like Deadwood, Dodge City, Abilene, and Tombstone had laws against carrying guns within town limits. Visitors had to surrender their firearms to the local sheriff, who would provide a token in return, similar to a coat check for guns but residents were given an exemption as they were allowed to keep their guns in their homes. Number 12. Cowboy meant criminal. During the Old West era, particularly in the vicinity of Arizona, the term cowboy carried a different meaning, being associated with criminals. In 1881, the San Francisco Examiner published an editorial stating that cowboys were regarded as the most audacious group of outlaws in that untamed region, surpassing ordinary robbers in their recklessness. Moreover, Tombstone was home to a well-known gang called the Cowboys, who were regular figures in the area. Number 11. Forget Jamestown. The oldest settlement in the United States is Acoma Pueblo. It is a well-known fact that Native American communities existed prior to European settlements but it might come as a surprise to some that Acoma Pueblo, located west of Albuquerque, New Mexico, has been continuously inhabited since the 12th century. The people still reside in their Sky City, 
a settlement situated on a mesa that rises 360 feet above the ground and is home to approximately 4,800 individuals. While traditionally engaged in hunting and trading, the Acoma community now generates its income through a cultural center and a casino complex. Interestingly, Santa Fe, the oldest state capital in the United States, recently commemorated its 400th anniversary, coinciding with Acoma's long-standing history. Number 10. Tumbleweed is as American as apple pie. The iconic image of tumbleweed rolling across the desolate landscapes of the American Southwest is a common sight in Western movies. However, it may come as a surprise to discover that this plant, known as Russian thistle, is actually not native to the United States. It originates from southeastern Russia and western Siberia. In 1873, it unintentionally arrived in South Dakota through a shipment of flaxseed. Within 20 years, it had rapidly spread across 16 western states and even reached Canada. Today, this invasive species covers around 100 million acres of land in the western United States, causing trouble for local ecosystems. Number 9. Dodge City was extremely violent. While the Wild West wasn't as chaotic as portrayed in the movies and TV shows, it certainly wasn't a law-abiding utopia. Among the towns in that era, Dodge City, Kansas gained a notorious reputation for its violence. Dodge City had an annual murder rate of 0.165, which means that 165 adults were killed per 100,000 people. This also indicates that a person living in Dodge City between 1876 and 1885 had a 1 in 61 chance of being murdered. Comparatively, in 2020, the world's most violent city, Los Cobos, Mexico, had a murder rate of 138 people killed per 100,000 people. Number 8. Native Americans were all hostile to whites. While it is true that many Native Americans resisted white settlers and the U.S. government through armed conflict, especially when their tribe lands were under threat, it is important to note that there were also indigenous people who collaborated with the settlers. These people served as scouts, giving guidance and advice to the army in its battles against hostile Native American groups. In 1866, the U.S. government authorized the establishment of a Native American force consisting of up to 1,000 men who would serve as both scouts and fighters, as mentioned on the official website. General George Crook extensively employed these scouts during his campaign against the Chiricahua Apaches, led by their chief, Cochise. Interestingly, the majority of his scouts hailed from rival Apache bands, specifically the San Carlos and White Mountain groups. Number seven, camels in Texas? Yep. During a short period, there were wild camels roaming the plains of Texas. In 1855, the U.S. government allocated $30,000 to purchase and bring camels in. Jefferson Davis, who was the Secretary of War at that time, believed that camels would be valuable for transporting goods to the West before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. So the government imported 75 camels and stationed them in Camp Verde, Central Texas, using them for supply trips to San Antonio. However, the mule lobby, known as Big Mule, opposed the integration of camels into the army, and when the Civil War began, the camel experiment was abandoned. After Texas succeeded, the Confederate Army took control of Camp Verde and set the camels free into the wild. Number 6. Cowboys didn't wear 10-gallon hats. In the Old West, hats were essential for outdoor activities. But the iconic oversized 10-gallon hats commonly associated with cowboys were not actually worn during that time. The hats gained popularity in the 1920s through Hollywood portrayals of cowboys. Instead, cowboys, ranchers, farmers, and people in various professions wore a flat-brimmed Stetson hat known as the Boss of the Plains. John Stetson, the hat's creator, observed that the hats worn in the plains were inadequate for the summer conditions. Straw, silk, fur, and wool hats were too hot for the summer or would absorb and hold rainwater in the spring. The Boss of the Plains hat was lightweight, waterproof, and durable. 
Its interior was insulated enough to be used as a water bucket for horses, while the wide brim provided protection for the neck and eyes from the sun and shed water. These hats were sold for $4.50 and were made from Utria fur, which would be equivalent to about $74 in today's currency. Number 5. The first armed bank robbery occurred in Massachusetts. The first bank robbery didn't take place in the Wild West, but rather in 1831, approximately 30 years prior to the Wild West era. But that particular robbery involved the use of forced keys and did not involve guns. The first stick-up-style bank robbery unrelated to warfare occurred in 1863 in Malden, Massachusetts. 863 in Malden, Massachusetts. The incident took place at noon when Edward Green, a 32-year-old postmaster, burdened with debt and struggling with alcoholism, entered Malden Bank to exchange money. Seeing an opportunity, Green hatched a plan when he walked into the bank on December 15th. At that time, only one person was present in the bank, a 17-year-old boy who was the bank president's son. After leaving the bank, Green returned home, retrieved his gun, and fatally shot the boy in the head. He then left the bank with $5,000 in cash, equivalent to over $105,000 today. Green's sudden ability to settle his debts raised suspicions among people. Allegedly, he confessed to the murder about a month later and was subsequently hanged in 1866. This made him the first person to be executed for an armed bank robbery in America as well. Number 4. The first train robbery happened in Indiana. The first train robbery took place on October 6, 1866, carried out by the Reno Gang. This historic heist was a remarkable feat. The gang boarded the train and compelled the messenger, who held the keys to the safe, to unlock one of them. Inside, they discovered $18,000 in cash, as well as jewelry and other valuables, which they pocketed. However, they encountered a challenge with a larger safe that lacked a key. In an attempt to take it with them during their escape, the Reno gang kicked the safe out of the train. Unfortunately, it proved too heavy, forcing them to abandon it where it fell. Two years later, in 1868, six members of the Reno gang were lynched and hanged on a tree. The location is now known as Hangman Cross, and their bodies were laid to rest in Seymour, Indiana. While their graves are accessible, they are located behind a small gate. Number 3. The first quick-draw gunfight occurred in Springfield, Missouri. The famous gunslinger, Wild Bill Hitchcock, had a dispute with a man named Davis Tutt over gambling. Tutt had backed other gamblers to defeat Hitchcock, but he lost, leading to a demand for $40 from Hitchcock regarding a previous horse deal. According to Tom Clavin's Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontier's first gunslinger, Hitchcock immediately gave Tut the $40, but Tut then asked for an additional $25. When Hitchcock refused, Tut took Hitchcock's pocket watch from the table. The next day, in the morning of July 21, 1865, Tut displayed the watch in Springfield, Missouri's town square. Despite Hitchcock's attempt to reason with him, Tut remained adamant. Just before 6 p.m., Hitchcock warned Tut not to parade around the square with the watch. Tut reached for his gun, and Hitchcock did the same. There was a momentary pause, and then they both drew their guns. The confrontation ended with Hitchcock shooting Tut in the heart. Number 2. America's First Serial Killer Family Emerged the Wild West is often associated with gunslingers and outlaws, but even serial killers had a presence. One infamous example is the Bender family, also known as the Bloody Benders. The German immigrant family resided in Labette County, Kansas for a brief period of one year, from 1871 to 1872. Their cabin had amenities such as a well and a barn with a corral, and they divided the cabin into a general store and a small lodging house for travelers. Contemporary accounts describe the Benders as unpleasant, odd, or unsettling individuals. The family consisted of John Bender Sr. and his wife, Elvira, along with their son, John Jr., and his possible sister or girlfriend, Kate. 
It is believed that the family murdered at least 11 people, burying their victims' remains in the orchard. As suspicions grew and the authorities closed in on the benders, the family mysteriously disappeared. Number one, the deadliest outlaw was John Wesley Hardin. John Wesley Hardin, hailing from Bonham, Texas, embarked on a life of violence and killing from a young age. Even at 14, he severely injured a fellow student with a knife, and by 15, he had shot and killed his uncle's slave, as well as three soldiers who pursued him. In his autobiography, Hardin boasts of killing 44 men, although many of these claims are unverifiable and likely exaggerated. Nevertheless, it is believed that he did take the lives of at least half that number, potentially up to 30 men. Hardin's narrative paints a picture of a relentless string of murders, which holds some truth. During his time in Abilene, Kansas, he crossed paths with Wild Bill Hitchcock, who was serving as a marshal. Strangely enough, the two seemed to get along without Hitchcock being aware of Hardin's wanted status for murder in Texas, or simply not caring. However, their relationship took a turn on August 6, 1871, when an intoxicated Hardin, disturbed by his neighbor's hotel room occupant's loud snoring, fired a shot into the room. It remains unclear whether his intention was to kill the man, but the snoring individual tragically met his demise as the bullet pierced his heart. This incident led to the infamous saying that Hardin was so mean, he shot a man for snoring too loud. Hardin subsequently led from both the town and Hitchcock, managing to elude capture until 1875. He was then tried and convicted for the murder of a popular sheriff in Comanche, Texas, at the age of 21. Sentenced to 25 years, Hardin served 17 before being unexpectedly pardoned upon his release in 1894. Sadly, just one year later, Hardin's life came to an end. Following an earlier altercation, he was shot in the back of the head while playing dice, and his assailant ensured his demise by firing several more shots. Remember, the history of the Old West is a blend of truth and legend, where reality often merges with the wild imaginations of storytellers. But one thing's for certain, the Old West continues to captivate our imagination with its larger-than-life characters, thrilling adventures, and incredible stories. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.